from competing at all in promotions and appointments if they elected to do so and if there was a, some kind of a controversy on the board. The new um, board was made up of 22 regular and 12 substitute members, so a massive expansion, but again, something that had been long called for by those seeking judicial reform. And the Ministry of Justice presence was not only diluted, so they were, remained limited to two, but the requirement of presence for a meeting to be convened was removed. So the actual degree of control from the government or from the executive over the internal appointments process of the judiciary was reduced, and the larger swath of the judiciary was represented in the Appointments and Promotions Board itself. These were the changes. Now, these changes were deemed to be an absolute open door to the AKP, and in many respects, they were. The question is, why is that a problem? And let's just step back and understand why, until that point, AKP sympathetic judges had been completely excluded from this board. The reason for that is the witness test I alluded to a moment ago. What the reform did was remove that witness test. And of course, the consequence is, if you have excluded, historically, from promotion to the higher courts, a swath of people based on their own partisan, apparent partisan makeup, then when you remove that witness test, what you're going to get is a much larger proportion to say any of people of that partisan persuasion in the board that you've now created because the board now is created from the actual underlying composition of the judiciary and not only those who have demonstrated ideological fidelity. So it is true that that is a consequence. It's a consequence because of the purpose that had been served previously by the board. This comes to the packing-unpacking element. The board had served as a court packing mechanism that resisted the underlying demographic shift in preferences and democratic mandate that had you know, emerged in the Turkish political order in the period in question, particularly since the AKP came into existence in 2002, and the, the expansion of the board produced the opposite of that. Now, whether to call that court packing or unpacking is, of course, a matter of interpretation of how you believe in a democratic system the courts should, in fact, be composed. A again, it reduced the actual role of the executive or the government in making choices around appointments and promotions, but it did increase the capacity of a broader swath of the judiciary itself to participate in judicial governance. And, the, and a broader swath of the profession, with the Turkish Bar Associations being included, as well as lower level prosecutors and so forth, in judicial self-governance. So what's the outcome? The question becomes, what does judicial accountability need to look like in a democratic transition? And what does judicial independence come to mean under these circumstances? So first of all, as I've already suggested multiple times, the reforms were actually welcomed by the Venice Commission and all these you know, liberal entities. And the response, of course, of those who thought I, you know, that I and the Venice Commission and others were crazy to speak well of the content institutional design-wise of the package was to say you're just useful idiots. I mean, you are basically an example of the kind of liberal that just allows, you know, you're a Weimar Democrat, you're just someone who doesn't understand what the underlying consequences are of your ongoing commitment to democratic and liberal institutional design because it's your democracy that's going to bring us one man, one vote, one time, or whatever number of doomsday scenarios one might have imagined. And it also opened the door to things that had been, you know, we had been promised from the same um, segments of the society would lead to an, an absolute and irreversible trend in the direction of polarization um, of society over questions of religion in particular, namely the introduction of women in headscarves on campuses and in civil service offices and so forth, generating an irresistible pull of proselytization and greater religiosity in the country and, and the like. So that's, that, that would be the interpretation of the critics. On the other side, I think the notion that one reverses through institutional design, the institutional capture of the judiciary by key elements in the state institutions may be a necessary step towards any notion of democratic consolidation or democratization if in fact you are committed to the idea that the basic core of democratic uh, principles, namely that government is selected by the people underlying and that there is some degree of accountability put in place for the institutions, that separation of powers must be balanced with checks and balances and so forth, then this institutional design would be one that one would have to endorse. The question is then, what effect did it have? And there are two sort of ways to now think about the current crisis we're in, and this is the final part of the comments that I want to make today, relating to the current judicial independence crisis. So first of all, let me just say something about the proposed new law on the judiciary. It actually sought to completely reverse exactly what was done in the 2010 amendments. So to be clear, the AKP proposed these amendments. I should have mentioned the amendments, every single one of them was taken from the 2007 draft, the highly liberal draft that I described. So they were opportunistic because they didn't take everything in that draft, right, at all. They didn't propose lots of forms of liberalization around, for example, ethnic definitions of citizenship, around the political part, party threshold, many other things that had been proposed in that constitution. But everything that they did include in the package had been drafted by those 2007 drafters. They 
you know, um, picked and chose what they wanted from that underlying draft. But it was the AKP that proposed it. What the AKP proposed this past February is to specifically undo exactly what they did to the Supreme Court judges and prosecutors and remove the control of appointments and promotions from the judiciary and return it to the Ministry of Justice. So give the Ministry of Justice back its veto powers, not just veto powers, allow them to appoint the chair and the deputy of the inspections board, so the board that would decide whether to investigate for misconduct, prosecutors or judges, in the midst of a corruption scandal in which the government itself is under investigation by prosecutors and judges, the notion was, let's inspect those very prosecutors and judges and see if they're not themselves engaging in some kind of illicit activity and so forth. The Ministry of Justice was also going to determine whether to launch investigations, so this investigative power that had been invested in the Supreme Court was being taken away. They were going to remove all senior members of the sitting board and replace them with Ministry of Justice appointees and so forth. Thankfully, um, all of these particular matters, there are a number of other things to the Turkish Justice Academy. Basically, the Ministry of Justice has also taken over control of which judges may be appointed to international posts as the representative of Turkey on the international court, which may be appointed for international training processes, and also what the training looks like in general for in-service judges and prosecutors as well as trainees is now in the control of the Ministry of Justice, and this hasn't yet, at least, been overturned by the Turkish Constitutional Court. But just as recently as Friday, happily for me as I'm giving this talk, the Turkish Constitutional Court reversed all of the elements that I described a moment ago, the seizure back of control of the, the board, the um, seizure of the power to engage in inspections, and so forth. So for the moment, the Turkish Constitutional Court that was packed has preserved the uh, non-independent Supreme Board of Judges and Prosecutors that was created in 2010, and we have a moment in which the very government, for tactical reasons or accidental reasons, that proposed those institutional changes, with, which at the time were decried as an assault on judicial independence, it's those institutions that have now represented the actual vanguard of resisting what do look like deeply um, anti-democratic and liberal overreach on the part of the government in their newly composed form. But what is the... Uh, broader belief about judicial independence in Turkey today, the notion is, I said a moment ago, that it's important to resist a definition of judicial independence that doesn't encompass the possibility of, that the courts may be subject to institutional capture, particularly in periods of democratic transition or democratization. Because in a democratic transition, there'll be every incentive, and there's a great book on this topic called Juristocracy by Rob Herschel that I've already recommended to a number of people around this table. Um, the courts are going to be invested with the capacity to preserve the privileges of an elite that is losing its ability to command electoral majorities. That's very commonly the case, either because there was no electoral functioning system that could afford democratic alternation to begin with, so the elite that was accustomed to governing without alternation of power now faces the possibility of alternation, or because an elite that had a lot for a variety of reasons on democratic balloting has lost that capacity, will invest courts in the capacity to block democratic reversal of their own privilege. So they will try to design institutions that are subject to capture. And I believe that the litmus test that I described to you in the Supreme Ju Board of Judges and Prosecutors represented precisely such an institutional device of capture and one that we've seen in other places. For example, in Argentina, put in place by the military junta, they step down civilianized government, but ensure that their own preferences and the institutional arrangement they put in place cannot be reversed democratically and for decades that holds. The same held true, I think, in Turkey. But there's a second kind of capture that can occur of the judiciary, and I think this is the thing that's animating the government's at least legitimatory framework about why it needed to engage in judicial reform at this moment, and also widespread popular perception in Turkey that the judiciary has been subjected to capture. And this is the notion that the Gulen network, and for people who are not studying Turkey, this may not be an especially you know, familiar term, but the notion that there's a kind of shadowy religious organization that has organized itself for decades with an express design to penetrate the state by engaging in scholarships and subsidies and training of a variety of kinds of students who are then basically instructed to go off and present themselves for civil service qualification exams or to train as judges and so forth and to infiltrate the institutions of the state in order to alter their composition from within. And that this movement has been so successful that they fundamentally altered the character of the bureaucracy that staffs all these unelected institutions and have subjected those institutions to a kind of social capture, if you want. So it's not by virtue of institutional design, it's not because of an elite um, mechanism for capture, but rather it's the opposite strategy. It's not some top-down control, it's a bottom-up sort of infusing of the branches with a particular organized campaign. Now this sounds terrible, it sounds terribly insidious, and it's a kind of capture that Turks are very, very anxious about at the moment around um, the Vidan movement. But the trouble is that bottom-up 
capture of judicial institutions is exactly what democracy invites. So another way to describe what the Gudan movement did is it formed effective civil society organizing mechanisms, it built scholarship programs, it basically helped support students that would be, you know, operate consistently with their sets of commitments, prior commitments, whether they be religious or their own preconceived notions of how the state should or should not operate, they encouraged those students to apply for civil service exams, they applied for those exams and you know, engaged in a normal competitive process but got in, and then they eventually came to occupy the lower swaths of a lot of these institutions such that you remove the litmus test and suddenly this is the group that now is able to engage in capture. And this is deemed from the perspective of the sort of outside critic who's especially skeptical of this group's motivations as equally illicit as any institutional design mechanism. The problem is, we have a name for this also in the United States. Again, I've given away my hand to numbers of people around this room who've heard me make this comparison, but it's called the Federalist Society in this country. In other words, the idea that you will organize yourself, raise money, build foundations, capture law schools, develop scholarship programs, deploy students in order to be committed to a particular project because you believe that the federal bench, for example, needs to be transformed, it's become too progressive, the war in court is a terrible low point, and what we need is to swing the pendulum back hard in the direction of fidelity to originalism and so forth. All of these are exactly the sets of um, dynamics that were set in motion in the 1970s when conservatives thought through what is the <coughs> crisis that we have, why have we failed to persuade a majority of Americans to be convinced of our ideological program, and it took decades to come to fruition, but in fact what they did is exactly the same thing. Now there are a number of distinguishing factors, and, and I thank Baki for pointing to some of these so that I can at least lay out in this concluding moment the distinction in my view between the kind of institutional capture that is problematic in terms of a democratic institutional design for a constitutional order, and this kind of social capture problem. So there are two distinguishing elements of the Federalist Society that Baki rightly pointed to, and I just want to address. The first is, of course, they're not guided by a religious leader, the Federalist Society, whereas the Fethullah Gulen movement is, and that might represent a special kind of threat in the context of a secular state. But I would posit in this secular state, under this constitutional um, interpretation of secularism, the one that is ascendant in the United States, it wouldn't actually have made it very much difference if uh, Pat Robertson or the 700 Club or somebody else had initiated a similar movement the notion that there were Christian evangelicals or people whose commitments to these conservative values were, were grounded in Christianity, organized through civil society, raised money, gave scholarships, and, and built a presence in the federal judiciary would be regarded as a problem in the same way that the Federalist Society is regarded as a problem, but not as a distinctive threat to the secular character of the state. The second distinguishing characteristic is that um, the Fethullah Gulen movement is very um, opaque, extremely non-transparent, in its organization, in its hierarchy, and how it conducts its funding, et cetera, in Turkey, how the operation of the organization actually works. And this is in contrast with the Federalist Society. By the way, it's also in contrast with how the Gudan movement operates in America. And I think that's an important and instructive lesson. Why is the Gudan movement organized in the way it is? Indeed, why is effective civil society participation in Turkey organized in the way it is? Because not only the Gudan movement, but numbers of other groups are accused of engaging in shadowy organizing mechanisms where Everything is not transparent, hierarchy is not clear, funding sources aren't available, and a conspiracy is afoot. So the KCK prosecutions, which are a set of prosecutions against a shadowy Kurdish organization that allegedly organized itself in unclear ways and produced a dragnet that was able to draw in not only huge swaths of the Kurdish intelligentsia as well as their elected officials, but also the, any elites that supported Kurdish rights in the western cities and so forth of the country, organized in a similar fa fashion of not transparent from the perspective of the state and so forth, it's precisely because of the repressive mechanisms of the state that do not permit open organizing for either religious orders or ethnic minorities, or for that matter, people who are identified as the hard left or people who are then described as anarchists and so forth. There is something about the repressive relationship of the state to civil society that has then produced a pathology in civil society of organizing, which generates a kind of problem that you are going to see in a federalist society Approach. Now, there are some examples in the United States where you might wonder whether you can really trace PAC money entirely from where it came from and so forth. I mean, there are ways in which there are also you know, mechanisms that make it more difficult to follow the money here under a variety of circumstances. But in Turkey, it's especially extreme, and, it's, and it is related to the quality of civil society and state repression, I think, which then points to a different kind of remedy. The problem with this social capture, again, as I suggest, is not a democratic problem. Democracies have to concede that they're open to this kind of movement. The better organized group, the better funded group, et cetera, 
if they engage in a concerted effort to enter into the state from within and from below, are going to succeed because the state, by definition, has to be open to meritocratic competition and access to state resources. It's not a democratic problem, it's a problem of democratic culture. And this is, I guess, where I'm going to end. I think that most of the institutional debates in Turkey are just diversionary debates about what the underlying problem is which is that we face a scenario of what appears to be an electoral, uh, sorry, a durable electoral majority for a group that has deeply polarizing effects on the country and that barely commands more than a majority. So it is able to durably produce what appears to be a majority, or let's say 51%, I mean it hasn't actually ever produced quite 51%, but let's just say arguendo that they were able to, 51% means 49% of the country feels disenfranchised in one way or another, and this is a hugely problematic issue. Now, if Turkey were to move in the direction of a bipartisan state, I mean, in the United States, we're very accustomed to this particular problem, but we also have a lot of institutional fixes for that problem because we have chosen to have a bipartisan order. In most countries, you have a multi-party system, as Turkey does, and it's an unaccustomed question to have this level of consolidated 51% control by a single party that seems to then not have, at best, shallow or accidental commitments to democratic or liberal values. That's the problem, which is a demographic, sociological, and you know, broader democratic cultural problem, but not either an institutional problem nor a problem of constitutional design until such time as we decide to have a bipartisan order, in which case it becomes a question of constitutional design because then there are checks that need to be put in place if you're not going to have a multi-party system to undercut the ability of a single party, for example, devolution, for example, having much more decentralized governance mechanisms comparable to what we have here, which allow for much greater regional competition where national competition has been sort of paralyzed through bipartisanship. But anyway, so to stop there, what I then come back to say as an abstract matter is, this argument hasn't been about judicial independence in my mind, but there is something about judicial independence that was at play. There was something problematic, and I think we see it even more clearly today in the Egyptian context and in a number of other contexts where democratization is directly forestalled through intervention where courts operate together with other unelected branches of government to make the possibility of electoral legislative reform or constitutional reform basically functionally, institutionally impossible. And this, I think, should tell us that we need to think through what we mean by judicial independence, particularly in the context of democratic consolidation, in a way that brings accountability back into the discussion. In a sense that is sort of implicit in any you know, uh, mature liberal democratic context, there is a notion that separation of powers is always connected to checks and balances. But the fact, this returns to false friends, the fact that those checks and balances may very well not be present in other institutional orders sometimes goes below the radar and requires closer attention to what we mean when we advocate for judicial independence. And I'll stop there. Um, I'm sure there are a lot of questions, and uh, I hope uh, you could follow it because it's a complex issue and a lot of people who follow Turkey have certain ideas about them, but I think those ideas by now should have been complicated but by what uh, Asta presented. So, yes, the floor is open for questions, please. Let me begin by saying something that um, I mean, maybe is unnecessary in this crowd, but I am definitely not a supporter of any of these movements, just to be perfectly clear. <laughs> My motivations do not come from a partisan commitment to any particular actor sometimes necessary to make that point in more densely Turkish audiences. So I, yes. I, I have a question. I left Turkey about 20, 25 years ago, so I get all my information from my very concentrated friends that are in Istanbul or Ankara, and they're, of course, uh, sky falling, sky falling constantly. So um, anytime any uh, religious threat to, to, to the Turkish um, state is a big problem with the elite Turkish elite. So any changes, even democratic, they always think that there's something behind it. There's always those conspiracy theories and things like that. So in your opinion, is there like a threat to the democracy ever in Turkey? Because this is always their nightmare. Like, yeah, well, it won't be like Iran. So, uh -huh. 
I mean, there are two different ways to answer that question. The first is, is there a threat to democracy, mm -hmm. which I'll address first, and then there's is there yeah. a threat to the secular character. Exactly, that too, yeah. The threat to democracy, I think there's a clear threat to democracy at the moment from the AKP, because mm -hmm. it keeps engaging in contemporary, like right now in 2014, attempted legislation, mm -hmm. which is being turned back by the courts for yeah. the moment, but all of which have a deeply um, anti-democratic character. So mm -hmm. the, the notion that the Ministry of Justice will just simply step in and control entirely judicial appointments directly and remove everybody up in one fell swoop and replace them with other people they like better, that they'll shuffle around hundreds of judges and prosecutors at once, etc., and do all of this directly through the cabinet is completely inconsistent with any notion of institutional checks and balances and separation of powers and so forth. So there's a clear attempt today. The thing I'm trying, I was trying to point to is the degree to which, in fact, what we now have as um, the existing uh, resistance institutionally to those moves is actually something that was produced by the very reforms that were being repudiated as mm -hmm. an assault on judicial independence three years ago. And actually, I mean, I should have made an additional point that I'll just speak to here, which is one way that the Gulad movements alleged captured the judiciary and the prosecutors and the police, et cetera, is being, has been pointed to now, today, belatedly, is their responsibility is attributed to them for the very poorly handled Aragonicon trials mm -hmm. and also the KCK trials. And I just think it's worth noting that both of those trials were initiated before the reforms I'm describing mm -hmm. even happened. So in other words, that claim that the Gulen movement had captured the judiciary and the prosecutors has to predate these judicial reforms because those prosecutions were initiated before the 2010 judicial reform package. So it can't be these reforms that suddenly caused the state to be captured in this way. But again, stepping even away from that institutional question, there's a problem, an underlying problem, which is low level of civil society organization that's capable of withstanding state pressure at the moment or using democratic channels in order to be able to stem the desires of the, the government, either by altering electoral performance of particular actors, as we saw in the most recent municipal elections, alternatives aren't easily produced, or in finding other effective channels besides the courts. So for the moment, the courts represent a kind of very thin barrier against what appears to be a deeply committed set of anti-democratic moves by the Prime Minister. There are a number of questions here. One is, what is the relationship between the Prime Minister and other senior members of his party? Are they all equally committed to the same anti-democratic and seemingly illiberal agenda? There have been moments where there are suggestions that there are, you know, there's some daylight, there's some cracks between different figures, and it's not clear to what extent Erdogan and the AKP are just can be treated as one, although that's very frequently the way they're treated in commentary and so on. So the depth of a threat is a question. The, the presence of the threat is not, because the Prime Minister has made it quite plain. But that's quite distinct from the secularism mm -hmm. question, which is a separate question. And there, I think, uh, part of it is a process answer. So for example, I'm, now I'm just going to switch out of Turkey and look at Egypt, where you, know, and, and you have a much, much more directly polarized debate. I and mean, I think for most Turks, it's hard to think of a more polarized time in Turkey than now. Mm -hmm. But it is possible to find more polarized examples mm -hmm. in the region than Turkey. And that example is a particularly instructive one. I think nobody could reasonably have described, it, described Egypt in 2011 as a deeply divided society. It was simply not a deeply divided society, 